Ever wonder what it was like to be a fly on the wall during the making of Michael Jackson's Dangerous? Oh, to be a fly on that wall. Yeah. Talk about a moment in music history. Right. And today we get a glimpse behind the scenes with My Brush With Badness by Rob Disner. I've heard of this. He wasn't a producer or anything, was he? Nope. He was a studio runner. Basically the guy who did a bit of everything, which in this case included some pretty unbelievable stuff. Okay, now you have to elaborate on that. Yeah. Studio runner for Michael Jackson. What kind of stuff are we talking about? Well, he describes one minute trying to fit a coffin-sized reverb unit into his beat-up Volkswagen, and the next, buying underwear for Michael Jackson. Wait, seriously? Underwear? Yeah, apparently Michael is kind of shy about that sort of thing, asked Disner to pick some up for him. Haynes, size 32. You know, you never really think about global superstars needing new underwear. kind of humanizes them a bit, doesn't it? And get this, Michael made him promise they wouldn't be too tight. It's such a strangely personal detail. I can't even imagine. Like, here's this musical icon at the top of his game worrying about the same things we all do. Makes you think about the pressures of fame, doesn't it? It really does. And it's not the only time Disner shares a glimpse into Michael's anxieties. Like, there's this other moment where, completely out of nowhere, Michael asks him if he'd be drafted if a war broke out. Oh, wow. Seems like he was genuinely worried about Disner having to go fight in the Gulf War. It's these unexpected moments that really stick with you. You know, makes you realize that behind the music, behind the persona, there's just a person with very real fears and anxieties. You know, when you think about it, Dangerous came out just a few years after the Gulf War. It's easy to forget the historical context sometimes, how those events might have weighed on his mind. Right. And on top of that, he's following up Thriller. Talk about pressure. No kidding. Thriller wasn't just an album. It was a cultural phenomenon. Exactly. So how do you even begin to follow that up? Well, it seems like Michael channeled that pressure into this relentless pursuit of innovation. Disner describes the studio as this total whirlwind of activity. I can only imagine. What was it like? Multiple producers, constantly changing directions, just this insane mix of sounds. Which makes sense, given what he was trying to do with this album. He wasn't content with just recreating past successes. Not at all. I mean, he brought in Teddy Riley, who was revolutionizing R&B with New Jack Swing. And you've got those rock elements, that industrial sound. Even opera. It's wild. Disner talks about listening to Slash from Guns N' Roses laying down a guitar solo one minute. Wow. And the next, it was a children's choir singing in Swahili. Talk about a mix. That's incredible. You know, it really shows you the collaborative nature of music, how these different creative voices come together. Absolutely. And at the center of it all was Michael. Disner said he had this almost superhuman musical memory. Like he could remember specific takes from weeks earlier. Really? Down to the smallest details. That's amazing. That's not just talent. That's serious dedication. It reminds me of those stories about Prince spending all night in the studio. Right. These guys were incredibly hard workers, despite all the, let's say, eccentricities. And speaking of eccentricities, didn't Madonna visit the studio at one point? She did. And, um, uh, well, let's just say Michael was not his usual self afterward. Oh. What happened? Disner says he was absolutely terrified of her. Wouldn't even say her name. Are you serious? <sighs> Madonna. That's hilarious. It makes you wonder what went down. I know, right? It's like a glimpse into this whole other world, the world of celebrity interactions that we never get to see. It's funny, isn't it? We get these little glimpses into Michael's life, like the underwear, being scared of Madonna. Hmm. And suddenly this larger than life figure feels much more relatable. Totally. And it's not just the anxieties, but also the ways he found comfort in simple things. Like Disner mentions that Michael often preferred simple meals, even though he had a personal chef. Chicken and rice, that sort of thing. Yeah, although there is that hilarious anecdote about Disner having to introduce him to McDonald's. Apparently, Michael had never even tried it. You're kidding. No McDonald's? Nope. It's like this whole other side of his life that we never knew about. It really makes you think about the strange bubble that fame can create. For sure. But speaking of unexpected things, Disner also talks about some of the behind-the-scenes decisions that shaped the album, like choosing which songs to include. Apparently, Michael recorded way more music than they could fit on one CD. Oh, I bet. I wonder what ended up on the cutting room floor. Right. Disner mentions this one track called Monkey Business that apparently had Michael's pet chimp, Bubbles, on it. No way. That would have been something else. Oh, talk about a lost treasure. But even with the songs that made the album, Disner has these great stories about how they came together. Like, remember the rap verse on Black or White? Of course. It's iconic. Well, get this. It was never supposed to be on the song. Disner says it was just a placeholder recorded by the producer, Bill Patrell. Wait, really? Yeah. 
But Michael loved it so much that they decided to keep it. Just goes to show you how these things happen sometimes. Absolutely. The magic of the studio, right? You never know where inspiration will come from. Exactly. And while we're talking about unexpected moments in the studio, yeah. you're never going to believe this. What is it? <laughs> what is it? So they had built this soundproof booth for Michael to record in, right? Right. And apparently, Michael, being Michael, was dancing while he sang. And, well, let's just say he got a little carried away. Oh, no. Tell me he didn't hurt himself. He backed right into one of those soundproof panels, and it fell on his head. You're kidding me. I'm serious. Disner says you can even hear Michael wince in pain on one of the early takes of the song. Oh, that's incredible. It's almost too perfect, considering the name of the song. Right. Dangerous, indeed. But, you know, for all the crazy stories, the thing that really comes across in Disner's book is the immense respect he had for Michael. I was just about to say that. You can tell he really admired him. He talks about Michael's kindness, his humility, even his shyness with such genuine warmth. Which makes those stories about him being afraid to go to McDonald's or pump gas all the more interesting. Exactly. It's like Disner captured this beautiful duality, the genius and the vulnerability it's a good reminder that even the biggest stars are still human, just trying to navigate the world the best they can. It really makes you think differently about the icons we idolize. It does. And for me, at least, it just adds another layer to how I hear dangerous. Knowing the stories, the people, the sheer amount of work that went into it makes you appreciate it on a whole other level. Absolutely. It's like getting a peek behind the curtain of music history. Exactly. And for our listener out there who might be revisiting Dangerous after this deep dive, what are you hearing now that you didn't hear before? What new meanings have you uncovered? Food for thought. Right. Definitely. And with that, we'll wrap up this deep dive into the making of Michael Jackson's Dangerous. Thanks for joining us.